Welcome to Cross Defense, where our goal is to excite the imagination, equip the mind, and comfort the soul with God's Word. Our foe is a fierce enemy. Our only defense is Christ on the cross. Let's get into it. It is Monday, July 27th, 2020. Glad to be with you today. My name is Pastor Tyrell Bramwell. I serve St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California, way out here behind the Redwood Curtain. It is a pleasure to be able to carry the torch for Brother Wolf Miller as he is down and out. Well, actually, he's recovering right now, but he got COVID. In just a second, we're going to let him tell you all about what happened and why I'm the voice you're hearing and not him. It is a pleasure to be here. We will keep the house in good order as best we can. We're going to have a good time. I really want to uh, encourage you to continue doing what you were doing with Pastor Wolf Miller here on this show. You can reach me, send me your comments, your questions, your theological thoughts at TyrellBramwell.com. Go ahead and use my contact form, just like you were using the contact form over at WolfMiller.co. Or you can find me on social media. I'm on YouTube, obviously, as well as uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The handle is always the same, at Tyrell Bramwell. should throw LinkedIn there, too. If you're a LinkedIn user, you can find me over there. I'm not quite as active as I am on the other sites, but... Uh, yeah, whatever your comments are, your theological questions, let's keep that ball rolling, and we'll uh, have some Q&A episodes in the future, bring up some emails and things like that to really spark our conversation and get us get us thinking about the world theologically. That's the goal. Well, in this show today, we're going to talk about COVID-19 as it's affected the host of this show. We're specifically going to focus on conversation around COVID-19, how we engage with our views and the information that we're receiving in a good, godly way. We're also going to talk about Christians in China and how the Communist Party is asking them to take down, well, maybe forcing them to take down images of Jesus and Christian art, replace it with communist leaders. And then finally, we're going to segue into miracles and ask the question, is Jesus still performing miracles in his church today? Stick around for that. It's all coming up. In this first segment, we're going to deal with COVID-19, and you have already heard that your host, Pastor Wolf Miller, got COVID. Well, let's let him tell you just what happened to him and why you're hearing me and not him. About three and a half weeks ago, I got really sick, uh, got a fever, and uh, felt pretty miserable. So we were talking with doctors and going to urgent care, had a COVID test. It came back negative, but since I've got the antibody test three times now and turned out positive. So it looks like I got COVID. I had about eight days of uh, pretty bad fevers, about five days of coughing. I was never short of breath. I never lost my sense of smell or taste, although like everything that I loved to eat uh, tasted terrible, like coffee sounded terrible, which I, I still can't believe. Um, so I had that for about eight days. We, we stayed, I stayed in isolation uh, in Colorado for a while and then we drove home and I continued in isolation uh, here until my symptoms were done and, and all the time of my isolation was over. And it looked like I was getting better about two weeks ago. Uh, but then when I came out of isolation, I kind of had round two of symptoms and it was strange. There, you know, these results are starting to come back that some of the novelty of the coronavirus is, you know, showing up in different things and it showed up with me. One of the things that happened was I lost a lot of my coordination. I lost, I, I couldn't really finish sentences. I started to stutter. I'd get halfway through a sentence, forget what I was talking about. Um, I couldn't write. I mean, like I couldn't hold a pen. It took me about, oh, about a, a week and a half ago. It took me about 10 minutes just to write my name. It was, I felt like I was in kindergarten and still my balance isn't back and I feel you know, I was trying to play catch yesterday with Andrew and I just couldn't, my reaction time, and I have to really kind of focus to make sure that I'm not um, uh, kind of panicking and stuff like this. So I had some neurological effects uh, from COVID. Now the doctors were t taking a lot of tests, um, did an MRI and an EEG and a, had a lumbar puncture. They're testing all that sort of stuff. And most of the tests were coming back very, very close to normal or normal. Uh, so it looks like I didn't have a stroke or anything like that. And it seems like I'm, I'm getting better. Uh, but in the meantime, we just had to drop everything. So uh, we're trying to do a lot of things uh, for teaching the scriptures. So we had the worldwide Bible class and table talk and, 
and cross defense and, and all this other stuff. Um, for the next six months, that's, that's done uh, or handed off to someone else. You gotta be praised that Pastor Wolf Miller is on the mend. Keep him in your prayers. Keep his family in your prayers as well and his congregations that he would have energy to serve them and to do it faithfully. And that was just a clip from his update video. You can find the whole thing on his YouTube channel, Brian Wolfman. Let's talk about COVID-19 in terms of conversation. There's a lot of information coming our way about this virus, and, and a lot of it seems to be contradictory, right? We have authorities, people who are supposed to be in the know, telling us different things. And uh, even some of the same people said one thing in the beginning and now are saying something completely opposite, and it's confusing. And so as Christians, we want to be able to engage in the conversation in a fruitful way. We want to avoid division and, and silly myths, right? The fiction and the, and the fruitlessness and be fruitful. So to do that, we can turn to 1 Timothy 1, specifically verses 3 to 7. And we're going to do that right now. We'll take a look at how we are to engage in conversation, not just about COVID-19. That's going to be our focus today, but about anything how we as Christians are to converse with others and do it in a way that is God-pleasing, good-ordered, and focuses on Christ. So 1 Timothy 1, starting at verse 3, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, this is Paul talking to Timothy, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths, you know, to fiction, to fables, legends, things that aren't true and endless genealogies, which promote speculations, right? considerations of things that aren't rooted in fact, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Right? He's talking to a pastor, but this extends to all Christians. Right? The aim of our charge, what we, what we want to be doing as we're going out into the world and bringing Jesus into the world, in our conversations, what we want to be doing is demonstrating love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these things, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident Assertions. Now, Paul's talking about a particular um, issue going on in that context, but we can pull from this some principles for ourselves in our context. And as Christians, we can learn how we are to engage our neighbor in conversation that is helpful. We want to avoid swerving away from truth. I, I like this language of swerving and wandering. It does excite the imagination. That's what we do at this show, right? We, we want to excite the imagination and equip the mind. Uh, language like swerving. Well, when, do you, when do you swerve? Well, I th immediately think of driving the car. I, I usually swerve to not hit the deer crossing the street, right? To not hit that the squirrel that runs across the street, something like that. Uh, we want to swerve to not hit the pedestrian in the crosswalk. We want to swerve to not hit the car that's not paying attention, right? We, we swerve to not get in a collision. Well, when we're talking about truth, you want to hit truth. You want to collide with the truth of Christ. You don't want to wander into what is vain, into what is fleeting and passing and means nothing. You want, to, you want to hit what is substantive and truthful and avoid what is void of substance, the lies, the fictions. Let's see what else Paul has to say in 1 Timothy. Let's go to 4.7 where we read, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. We get some more descriptive language here that does excite the imagination. Irreverent. We want to be reverent, right? We want to avoid irreverent, silly myths, silly fictions. The same kind of conversations that we're having about COVID-19, whether we should wear masks or not wear masks, whether it's a cold or not a cold. A lot of these conversations are really, we don't have all the information. We're not in the right place where God has put us to really form an opinion. Although if we go back to 1 Timothy 1, we want to, uh, we want to assert our opinion with confidence, right? We want to put out our understanding, our viewpoint, as if it was 
factual and true, but we don't have all the information. And Pastor Wolf Miller, in his situation, he has all the information about his interaction with it. Very personal in this way. Very subjective in this way. And we want to we get back to objective truth. What is concrete in the midst of all the stuff that's going on in 2020? The most concrete thing, Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. Our help in times of trouble, right? Well, finally, before we go to break, let's take a look at uh, one more passage from 1 Timothy. We're going to go to 6. Uh, what is it? 3, 8, 3 to 8. First Timothy 6, 3 to 8. And then we're going to let Pastor Wolf Miller give you a little bit of uh, encouragement as we segue into the next segment. First Timothy 6, 3 to 8. We read, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings that accord with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. All right. Well, Pastor Wolf Miller is going to talk about contentment in just a moment. I'm going to let him talk about that as we segue into the next segment. But isn't that true? I think we just got a description. I think Paul was talking about every conversation that happens on social media. They always tend to bring out controversy and quarrels, even about words, right? Someone will post something. And uh, someone else will, will comment about their, their turn of phrase, a little subtle, or even a typo, right? <laughs> we get so caught up in dissension and slander and evil suspicions, constant friction, constant friction in our conversation these days. We got to go back up to verse four. He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. The, the old way of saying that was, it's kind of fun, ignoramus, right? Ignorant without understanding and ignorant isn't necessarily an insult we often use it as an insulting word you're you're ignorant well it's only it's only insulting in that it's saying you don't know it's okay to be ignorant on certain things right like i'm ignorant on what it takes to go to the moon i i have no no understanding in rocket science nothing i'm ignorant when it comes to to surgery I could not operate on a single person. I'm ignorant when it comes to making a fine meal. I can make pancakes and I can make grilled cheese and that's about it. Everything else, I'm ignorant when it comes to making delicious cuisine. And that's okay. That's not insulting, right? It's not insulting to not know, but it becomes an insult when I, when I posit that I know, when I'm puffed up and conceited and I, and I assert my my opinion as if it's true when i try to show that i know something when i don't puffed up with conceit and understands nothing is ignorant an ignoramus he has an unhealthy craving for controversy isn't that interesting how someone without the knowledge we we, we crave controversy you're ignorant of something and yet you want to put yourself out there as knowing knowing what's right and and, and want people to to hear you out when you have nothing really to offer the conversation that's where i'm at with a lot of this this stuff on covid 19 that's where most of us are we don't have all the information we can make some of us more than others educated guesses we can use the information we do have that we have received and we can do it in a godly way we can make decisions for our lives and our vocations right as a pastor i'm making decisions for the church using what God's word says and the information coming down to me to make wise choices that are informed, that aren't ignorant. And, and also like as a father, as a husband, whatever your vocation is, you get to do this as well in your vocation. But there is a, uh, there needs to be an honest recognition that I'm ignorant of a lot of stuff, even regarding COVID-19. And so I'm not going to assert my opinion as if it's fact puffed up and conceited and causing controversy quarreling about words 
which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. Just take a minute and just digest this list. Constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. We're so divided. There's a way to fix that. You and I can focus on Christ crucified for the forgiveness of our sins as we converse about COVID-19 and everything else under the sun. I'd love to hear your comments on what we're talking about. Please make sure you use TyrellBramwell.com or any social media platform to reach out to me. Let me know your uh, theological questions, your insights, your angle on this, what you're, what you're thinking as we're talking about 1 Timothy and talking about vain discussions and speculations and avoiding myths. Uh, let's keep each other accountable and engage and wrestle with this theology together. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute. But before we go to that break, here's Pastor Wolfmiller talking about being content as a student of Christ. I always, I've always thought that one of the most difficult uh, temptations for me would be that if I couldn't make stuff, if I couldn't do stuff, if I couldn't create uh, stuff, um, I've always loved to, to teach. And I, I thought that if that capacity was taken away from me, that that, that would be really hard, that that would be a, a, a kind of a deep wound to suffer. And so at some point I, I was sort of wrestling through that and I was, I was laying there and I was thinking, well, maybe I, uh, maybe I, I won't be able to teach again. You know, maybe I won't be able to talk. Maybe I won't be able to, to do that sort of stuff. And, uh, and, then, and then I thought, oh, that would be really hard because who, you know, who am I then? I'm just, you know, if I, can't, if I can't know something to help somebody, then who am I? And, and I realized all of a sudden that this was actually pretty simple, that, that I belong to Jesus and that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And the Lord is, is blessed through all of it. In fact, like for the whole week last week, the scripture that just kept coming to my mind was the words of Jesus to St. Paul when he says that my strength is made perfect in, in weakness. And so, um, so I, I want you guys to know that uh, if something happens and I can't come back and teach the Bible, that's great that, that, that my great joy is not being a teacher of the Bible, but being a student of the Bible. And I decided yesterday, I'm kind of excited about this, when I realized that, that I'm not quitting the worldwide Bible study, I'm just quitting teaching it, but I'm not going to quit going to it. Or I get to learn it, that, that maybe my vocation now is still the greatest in the world, and that is to be a, a student of the Lord's kindness and a recipient of, of God's grace. <laughs> and, and if we have that, I mean, if we have the Lord giving his life to us, then, then what more could we want? Oh, God be praised. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 states, If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Find this true wisdom in Christ on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on Worldwide KFUO. Sharpen the iron of your faith together with two pastors as they take up the sword of the Spirit to proclaim the gifts of Christ crucified and risen for you. Sweet, you made it back from the break. We must be doing something right. This is the first episode with your interim host. I'm Tyrell Bramwell, the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California. And let me remind you again to send your comments, your questions, your theological insights to me at tyrellbramwell.com. You can find my contact form there. You can also message me those, direct message on any of the uh, social media outlets that your favorite social media outlet, go ahead and use that one. And uh, you can even make a comment, post on my wall, my feed, I don't care. Just reach out to me. Let's keep that going so that we can have some Q&A and we can do this together. I left you with Pastor Wolfmiller's thoughts about being a hearer of the word. That His number one vocation, his chief vocation, is to receive God's word, to listen to it, not necessarily to speak it. And that summarizes what we talked about in the first segment, doesn't it? We don't have to engage 
in every fleeting discussion online or in person in your own vocational realm, wherever you are, you don't have to engage in every single thought that is posited and put forward to you. You can just listen, nod and listen. You don't even have to engage. That's okay. And in fact, I think the world would be a better place if more of us did that. Now, in this segment of the show, we're going to talk about news that's coming out of China. Christians over there are being persecuted by their government. Before we even get to the article at hand, this is a good opportunity to promote Pastor Wolf Miller's work on the subject of martyrdom. All right. His most recent book, And Take They Are Life, Martin Luther's Theology of Martyrdom, is a must-read, as well as his previous book, a, faith, a Martyr's Faith in a Faithless World. That's what it's called, A Martyr's Faith in a faithless world. Make sure you give those a read. You will be benefited by that. You might also want to take a look at something a little more historic, something like Fox's Book of Martyrs. That's on my nightstand right now, and it's a great time in history to start reading these kind of works and maybe even preparing ourselves for what lies ahead. This article is coming from the Christian Post. It's titled, China Orders Christians to Take Down Crosses, Images of Jesus, Worship Communist Leaders, Not God. It was posted on July 18th, 2020, and it was reported by Leah Marie Ann Klett, a Christian Post reporter. So apparently, if you're impoverished, if you're on state aid in China, in certain provinces of China anyway, you are at risk because they are coming around and telling you that if you want to continue to receive your welfare check, you need to take down your portrait of Jesus, take down those crucifixes, and instead hang up pictures of the communist leadership and hang up a portrait of Chairman Mao and President Xi Jinping, or risk losing your welfare. This is the sort of thing that's happening over there. I want to pull out one thing from this article in particular as we, we aim to have fruitful conversation on these things and not veer off into vain discussions. This is, this is the, the quote that's coming from, uh, it's being quoted from the, the South China Morning Post. Uh, actually reported this in 2017 to give some context. And this is what a uh, CCP member says, a China Communist Party member says, many poor households have plunged into poverty because of illness in the family. Some resorted to believing in Jesus to cure their illness. But we tried to tell them that getting ill is a physical thing and that the people who can really help them are the Communist Party and General Sec Secretary Z. All right, that's what we're going to focus on right now in this segment. That aspect of this article in particular. We tried to tell them that getting ill is a physical thing. My friends, dear theologians out there in the world, is Jesus only our help in spiritual matters? Or is he a help in physical matters as well. We know he is, right? Every single miracle that Jesus performed. How many, how many healing miracles are there? How many healing miracles did Jesus perform as he walked this earth? Let's go to Matthew 4, 23 to 24. Matthew 4, 23 to 24 is just going to give us a, just what we need. I mean, we're, we, could be, we could be here all day reading about the, the physical healings that Jesus performed did while he was walking this earth in his physical body. But uh, 4.23 to 24 is enough to, to make the point. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics. And he healed them. Boom. Drop the mic. Right? There it is. Jesus is not just our spiritual helper. He's the great physician. Physicians heal physical bodies. Jesus heals us. I actually like this report because it pins us to the wall, doesn't it? You don't have to be a member of China's Communist Party to believe that Jesus is of no help physically. To, to end up, practically speaking, we, we all do this way too much. I do this more often than I'd ever like to admit, and now I'm admitting it to you all. We end up, we end up thinking of Jesus as our spiritual Savior. He's, it's all, you know, everything Jesus-related is spiritual in nature, not physical. 
this is a big problem in the Western church, especially at least in my context in America, is a huge problem. By default, pragmatically, we end up relegating Jesus to spiritual things, which is why we see a lot of people not coming to church, why we see a decline as part of the problem, and why even in the midst of COVID-19, when we're, when we're forced to not worship together, as we've all recently gone through, and we're kind of you know, just listening online, we're seeing a decline in even people listening to God's word on the internet, because it's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. If we remember, and this is what's so great about being a Lutheran, if we remember that Jesus cares just as much about our body as he does our soul, we can counter this, this kind of thinking. Let's go to Acts 4, 33, and then we're going to jump to 5, 12. Acts 4, 33. I'm going to see what Peter and the boys were doing. They got them in hot water with, with their leadership, their, their governing authorities. Acts 4.33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. And we'll pick back up at 5.12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Let's stop right there for a second. What's happening? Physical healing accompanying the gospel. The gospel that Jesus has handled the death problem by himself physically being resurrected from the dead, being the first fruits of the resurrection, right? And this gets the apostles in hot water. But during the night, oh, excuse me, starting at 17, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. And jumping to verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Jesus cares about our physical bodies as, as much as he cares about our spiritual our side of things, our soul, right? He cares about your well-being. This whole idea of understanding Jesus as only a spiritual savior, separating him from the physical, this is enthusiasm, right? That's what we're dealing with. This Christian Post article is, is highlighting, even in China, in the midst of, of communist China, the idea that the heresy of enthusiasm is alive and well. Well, I know Cross Defense listeners are familiar with Peeper's Christian Dogmatics. So let's, let's go there right now and let's refresh our minds on what enthusiasm is. And specifically, as we're thinking about it in, in terms of physical versus spiritual, as we're thinking about real people who are being told, don't, don't hang up a picture of Jesus. Put your trust in someone who's actually here, someone physical here. Now, put your trust in the Communist Party and the leaders. This is a physical thing you're dealing with when you're ill. It's not a spiritual thing, so you don't need Jesus. And now let's hear what Pastor Pieper has to say. All of us are by nature enthusiasts. Instead of listening to and believing God's declarations of love in the gospel, in the means of grace given by Him, or in other words, instead of fixing our gaze on God's reconciled heart, which, thanks be to God, is a present reality through Christ and is revealed and offered to us by God in the gospel and the sacraments, we look into our own heart and seek to gauge God's feelings toward us by the thoughts and moods we find in our heart. All right, now, now here's the part where we're really going to start touching on what we're talking about right now. Christianity is an absolutely unique religion. It completely transcends human the human horizon and our inborn conception of religion. 
I just want to I just want to hang on that for a while. Just just those two sentences. Christianity is an absolutely unique religion. It completely transcends human horizon in our inborn conception of religion. What's unique about Christianity? What makes Christianity different from every other religion, different from our inborn conception of what religion is? Well, every other religion in the world and our default disposition toward religion is, is that of the law, right? Religion is about what you must do to get to heaven, to get to nirvana, to get to paradise, to get back to God, right? That's, that's a bare bones idea of what religion is. Christianity doesn't say you have to do anything. Christianity says everything's been done for you. Christianity says someone outside of yourself has taken care of your problem, taken care of that which separates you from heaven, that which separates you from God. Christianity says Jesus came physically, dwelt among humanity, God in the flesh, to do for us. That's quite unique. You now, Christian, believer in Jesus, have nothing to do. That is, in terms of salvation, ultimately, right? That's what we're talking about. That you have nothing left to do to get to heaven. Nothing left to do to be uh, back with your Lord. To be restored to your God. It's all been done for you. And if you can turn to God to handle that sort of situation, this great issue, salvation, to handle your redemption, your justification, if you can turn to God to do for you what you cannot do to get to heaven, you can certainly turn to God, to Jesus, the great physician, to handle the lesser situation. You can turn to God to heal your physical body, to take care of your emotional angst, to mend a relationship between you and a sibling or a friend. You can turn to God for all of the things that you deal with in this life. You have physical illnesses. You're dwelling in China and you have physical illnesses and you're turning to Jesus. You're turning to the right person. You're turning to the one who can do for you while you yourself can't do anything to get better. Luke 8, starting at verse 43. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing around you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Christianity, being a unique religion, is visible even in the situation of Jesus being physical because he's outside of us. As we see as an example here in this text with this woman, she went to physicians for 12 years. She went to people outside of her for 12 years because she herself could not, within her own body, she could not stop the flow of blood. So she went to a helper, someone outside of herself, to see if they could help, and only Jesus could. Right? Now, sometimes, sometimes the Lord works through human physicians, of course. We're not talking about that, not saying that doesn't happen. And he even works through political leadership. So in this case of the, the CCP in China, yes, the, the Communist Party could help the people in China. They, they absolutely could. And we'd recognize that as, as God working through means, working through uh, an outward source of help for, for the people, for his people. But to put Jesus into a spiritual realm and say he's not a, a physical help, this is a misunderstanding. And it's a, it's a law gospel thing, as we see here, right here in Peeper, who says very clearly that Christianity is a unique religion because it goes against the inborn conception, our, our natural disposition toward what religion is, which is law-based. 
It is I have to do for myself based as opposed to it's already been done for me. Someone else outside of me is going to get the job done based, right? Law, gospel. And Christianity is the only religion in the world that is gospel based. That says done, did, over, for you. All right. Back to Peeper. Therefore, our spiritual life is lived on the right basis and in agreement with the unique character of the Christian religion only when we base our faith in God's grace on the means, the means of grace lying outside us, the word of the gospel and its seals, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In the small called articles, Peeper reminds us, Luther says, and in those things which concern the spoken outward word, we must firmly hold that God grants his spirit or grace to no one, except through and with the preceding outward word, in order that we may thus be protected against the enthusiasts, i.e. spirits who boast that they have the spirit without and before the word, all this is the old devil and old serpent who also converted Adam and Eve into enthusiasts and led them from the outward word of God to spiritualizing and self-conceit. In a word, enthusiasm inheres in Adam and his children from the beginning, from the first fall, to the end of the world, its poison, having been implanted and infused into them by the old dragon and is the origin, power, life, and strength of all heresy. Therefore, we ought and must constantly maintain this point that God does not wish to deal with us otherwise than through the spoken, the spoken, right? The physically spoken word and the sacraments. The word attached to water, a physical element, and the word attached to bread and wine, physical elements. It is the devil himself, whatsoever, is extolled as spirit without the word and the sacrament. Scripture obliges us to maintain that in the case of all who want to detach God's gracious revelation and operation from the means of grace, we are dealing with ignoramuses. And he cites 1 Timothy 6.4. And quacks who do not realize what they say or set down. That member of the CCP doesn't realize what he's saying. We don't realize what we're doing when we end up, by practicality, relegating Jesus to a spiritual Savior. When we, we put him in a box and we, we fail to remember that he cares as much, as much about our physical bodies as he does our spiritual bodies. We end up being that way. And why do we end up doing that? Because, as we heard, we are all by nature... Our old Adams, we are enthusiasts. We want to detach God from his word, from, from the outward spoken physical means of grace. We're going to talk more about this after the break as we ask the question, is Jesus still doing miracles in this church today? Healings? Does he still care about our physical bodies as we gather in church? Don't go away. We'll be right back. Concord Matters is the program where we seek to be of one mind that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, Christ-confessing Concordians read through and discuss the Book of Concord, which is our Lutheran confession of faith drawn from Holy Scripture, so that you too may be of one mind and confess with Christ. Be sure to listen every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central on KFUO Radio or anytime on KFUO.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. Until we convene for Concord again, keep confessing, church. Thanks for sticking around during the break. We're back for more Cross Defense on July 27th, 2020. We looked at China and what's going on over there and how people are turning to Jesus for their physical well-being. And we've already dealt with the fact that Jesus does care. 
Scripture is clear. Jesus does care about our bodies. But the question is, now in this segment, is he still actively healing us? Are miracles still taking place in church? There's another way to ask the question. And the answer is yes. You might be scratching your head. Well, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't really seen a miracle take place at church, Pastor. Not anytime soon. COVID aside and all the stuff and not being able to gather. Even when we were regularly meeting. But I don't know the last time I ever, if, if ever, saw physical healing happen at church. And to you, my friend, I would say, have you seen a baptism lately? Have you ever seen a baptism? Have you heard the word of God preached? From the pulpit, by a man, Jesus sent to you. Have you seen the celebration of the Lord's Supper? These things are miracles. We just have to have eyes that see. Just as Jesus preached, he who has eyes to see, let him see. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. They have been masked. They have been hidden. They're mysteries, right? The word sacrament means mystery. They are mysteries. Baptism and communion, especially as we think about these things are indeed healings, acts of healing. Our Lord is performing in the same way that he performed acts of healing through the apostles. People were flocking to them. And what was the point of the acts reading, right? We were focusing on the physical healing side of it. But what was the point of the acts reading? People were flocking to the apostles, sure, to be healed. But Luke tells us, and they were believing in Jesus. The church was growing. Both men and women were believing. By the droves, people were coming to believe in Jesus, the one who does physical healing. And that's what he does in church every single Sunday. As the Holy Spirit brings the preached word to your ears, and the dead man is made alive. Resurrection of the body is given to you. Baptism is, is that resurrection. Baptism is that, that revivication, right? The, the bringing to life of the dead man. Communion. Communion is the feasting on Christ's body and blood, the very body and blood of the resurrected Christ. Jo John 14. Yeah, what is it Jesus says? John 14 um, let me flip there for a second. Jesus tells the disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, we're going to talk about this uh, in, in terms of not being able to perceive the miracle happening at church. You know, communion is an amazing miracle. Communion is the distribution of Christ's body globally, Right? Everywhere, at every altar, every Sunday morning, communion happening globally. Tell me that's not a great miracle. The distribution of Christ's very body and blood. So let's uh, finish this John 14 reading. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Believe on account of the miracles and all the things I've done. Right? Believe on account of what you can visibly see. If you cannot believe because of this thing that you're having a hard time seeing, believe on account of the thing you can see. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We have here this idea that it's hard to see the reality of what's happening in the Christian life, in church, right? We see the disciples saying, well, show us the Father. Well, you've seen the Father, guys. If you've seen me, you've seen him. We go to church on a, a regular basis and we say, well, show me the miracles. Well, you've seen the miracles, guys. If you've seen the sacraments, you've seen the miracles. Right? And this idea that even greater miracles than what 
the Lord did during his, his time, right? Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. And not on his own ability, right? It's, it's still Jesus doing them, but he's now doing them through the church. And he's saying that the works that we do now in the church are greater than the works he did. We, very simply, and we could, we could spend an entire episode just unpacking this, but very simply, we're seeing a miracle happen on a global scale every single week. This is very much a paralytic, paralytic situation. Or Jesus forgives the man's sins. That's the greater miracle. Let's go to Matthew 9 and, and take a look at the paralytic. And then you'll know what I'm talking about here. So we have um, right there at the beginning of Matthew 9. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. The greater miracle is that a sinner like you, like me, who has not deserved grace, who has not deserved forgiveness, receives it. That's the greater miracle. And then Jesus says, but so that you believe, right? So to, to, to prove the point, he tells the, the paralytic, rise, take up your mat and go. The physical healing was evidence of the greater healing. And we have, we have the greatest physical healing that ever was. We have the evidence. Christ on the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus stands as a, a miracle we all get to look to. It has been recorded and testified to, locked down, securely, beyond doubt, holding up even in the strictest court of law. This is the miracle. This is the out, outside physical, visible sign, Jesus on the cross, in the tomb, and then resurrected, is the physical sign that accompanies the great truth of baptism, preaching, and the Lord's Supper. They seem like simple things. From our perspective, it seems like the greater thing is the healing of the body. Far greater than to say, I forgive you. That seems so simple. So, so basic. I mean, we hear language like that all the time. I forgive you. I'm sorry, right? I forgive you. But we don't see paralytics taking their mats and going home every day, right? So it seems like from our perspective that the paralytic taking up his mat is the physical healing is the greater thing. But Jesus is saying the forgiveness of sins is the greater thing. He says the works that the church does in his name, baptism, communion, that the preaching of the gospel, that's the greater thing. It's interesting to think about the cross as the miracle that now informs all the activities of the church today. That the cross some 2,000 years ago, the actual cross that Jesus hung on, the actual tomb that is empty because he was resurrected from it, that that miracle of healing of resurrection from the dead is the outward visible evidence, that's what miracles are for, right? They are outward signs that people can see. That, that's the outward sign that informs everything that happens every time you're in church. The preaching, the baptisms, the Lord's Supper. That you don't, you don't see a resurrection happening at the baptismal font, but it is. Now, you don't see the miracle, but the miracle happened on the cross and it gives shape to it gives evidence to the mundane thing that you're witnessing every day at church you don't feel like you have been resurrected from the grave when you're baptized i don't feel like i receive christ's body and blood in communion but i do 
Why? How do I know? Well, the outward sign of the cross is so great that it is what gives evidence to all of the reality that's happening at church. Right? That's, what, that's what Jesus did when he came. The incarnation of Christ, the miracle of Christ, his miraculous birth and life. It is giving evidence to the great reality that God loves you, that you can't always see. But you know, concretely, it's recorded in history, God loves you. You can look at the cross and you can know, my God cares for me not only spiritually, but physically. He, he cares about me physically so much so, this is a continuation of our second segment, right? He cares about me physically so much so that he sent his son to dwell in the physical world, to take on my flesh, and to be crucified in that flesh in my place. So if, you're, if you want to know, is the, the, the answer to the question, God does care about our physical well-being, and, and Jesus is still actively doing miracles, doing signs, though they are hard to see. They're all actually a continuation of the, the miracle of the cross. Right, baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, you receive the fruit of the cross. It is directly connected to the cross. No cross, no communion. Right? The cross is where it occurred. Communion is where it's distributed. The grace of God. Baptism too. There would be no need to do any baptisms if Christ had not been baptized, if Christ had not died and been resurrected, because that's what's happening in the baptism. You are dying to your old self to sin and being resurrected in Christ. Right? Romans 6 stuff, right? This is what Paul teaches to the Romans. He says, uh, give me a second to get there again. All right. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the miracle of the cross, and this is why we can say, even though it is hard to see, and even though people will call us fools, oh, the folly of the cross. This is why it's a miracle. This is why we believe in Jesus. Because we have an outward visible sign, the cross, that informs all of the activities that we are doing. Right? Well, that'll be about it. Our time is just about up, guys. Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for listening to me, for having me here on the show. It's been great to be on Cross Defense with you all. I look forward to next Monday at 2 p.m. when we can do it again. And in the meantime, why don't you use your mobile device or your laptop, your desktop, whatever. Shoot me some messages, tyrellbramwell.com. You can find a contact form there to reach out to me. Or you can go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. I think that about does it. And uh, post comments there. Direct message me there as well. I look forward to... Uh, doing this together. And also in the meantime, why don't you tune into some more great KFUO programming. KFUO.org is where you can find Christ-centered content. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Kind of fun being a spokesman for KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. <laughs> Our foe is truly, truly a fierce enemy. Our only defense Christ on the cross. We'll see you next week.
Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.